So my name is Dr. Joseph Sullivan. I am a professor of pediatrics and neurology at the University of California, San Francisco, where I direct the Pediatric Epilepsy Center. As a pediatric epileptologist, I see all types of children with epilepsy, but really have a clinical and research focus on caring for children with Dravet syndrome. I've had the opportunity to serve as a principal investigator in a number of clinical trials, and I'm really excited about some of the pipeline uh, therapies that are in development today. Dravet syndrome has received a lot of attention over uh, the last uh, 10 years. It is arguably one of the uh, best understood uh, pediatric onset genetic epilepsies as the, the genetic basis of the disorder has been known for over 20 years now. It's actually a little bit more common than we initially thought. It's thought to uh, affect about one in 16,000 uh, live births. Uh, and although there is an unfortunate premature mortality in up to 20%, of patients living with Dravet syndrome, often in the setting of SUDEP or other seizure-related uh, uh, conditions, the majority of these patients are living uh, into adulthood. And so I think we're gaining a much better understanding of the evolution of the syndrome over the lifespan. Uh, as I mentioned, the genetic cause is really well understood in the majority of cases of Dravet syndrome. It's thought that pathogenic variants in the SCN1A gene account for 90% of those that have the clinical diagnosis of Gervais. And so understanding uh, that genetic basis and the haploinsufficiency that results in the loss of function from that gene really allows some creative genetic uh, disease modifying approaches uh, to, be, to be developed. So one of these approaches that really tries to exploit the fact that patients living with Gervais syndrome have a normal functioning copy of the SCN1A gene is this approach called TANGO, which stands for Targeted Augmentation of Nuclear Gene Output. And this is the approach uh, that Stoke Therapeutics is taking with their Zerivanersin compound. And the way that this uh, compound works is that it targets an aberrant splicing event that essentially occurs when the pre-messenger RNA is being uh, produced from, again, that normal wild-type gene. Um, and what this does is this alternative splicing event ends up uh, including um, what has been called a poison exon. And that poison exon essentially uh, leads to this nonsense-mediated decay. So you basically have this extra pre-messenger RNA uh, that has been uh, derived from the normal wild-type gene that simply is not um, converted into productive messenger RNA and therefore is not converted into functional NAV 1.1, which is the sodium channel uh, protein. And so uh, Zareva uh basically promotes the exclusion of this exon. So once this exon is excluded, uh, we are essentially turning non-productive pre-messenger RNA into productive messenger RNA, and therefore that messenger RNA can then be utilized uh, and, and translated into functional NAV 1.1 protein. And then once that protein is be, has been produced, it can be inserted into the neuronal cell membrane and ideally uh, restore uh, that haploinsufficient state that results from that loss of function from the mutated gene. So a phase one, two, a study of Zareva Nursen uh, has been recently completed and the study actually uh, started uh, a few years ago. So we actually have a lot of great long-term uh, data to actually present with regard to how these patients are doing in the open label um, extension. So this trial, uh, the initial phase 1-2-A trial was a dose escalation uh, safety and tolerability uh, study primarily. And then all of those patients were eligible to enroll into the open label extension at various doses as the phase 1-2-A uh, allowed for the safety and tolerability uh, to be um, better clarified and understood. Uh, and the data that we're actually presenting um, this year has actually been um, really, really uh, exciting. So after the phase 1-2-A study uh, was uh, complete, 
um, patients were allowed uh, to roll over into uh, two open label uh, extension studies, receiving uh, whatever dose was actually deemed uh, to be safe and well tolerated uh, at that time. And so the data that we have um, presented really looks at all patients that had received a total dose of greater than 30 milligrams um, during the open label extension. So that's going to include patients that receive 30 milligrams or 45 milligrams or up to 70 milligrams. And then furthermore, there were different dosing cohorts that actually led into this open label extension in terms of those patients being a single ascending dose um, versus a multiple ascending dose uh, with the Admiral study uh, patients actually receiving two or three doses uh, of the 70 milligrams. And so we actually have nice follow-up data of that 70 milligram cohort uh, out to week uh, 32, where there is a very impressive, sustained uh, and meaningful um, reduction of seizures of upwards of 75% uh, in these patients. Um, the patients that did receive the lower dose uh, also had sustained and clinically meaningful improvement uh, in their seizures of around 50%, highlighting a really nice uh, dose-related uh, response uh, in those that actually uh, received, uh, received that higher dose. And then if you look at the patients that received um, the 70 milligram uh, dose uh, in the phase 1-2A baseline, we can actually see um, that they actually had that initial reduction in seizures maintained, even though they were only receiving 45 milligrams uh, in the subsequent open uh, label ex extension study. So kind of highlighting um, that you can get this, it almost seems like a, a loading impact uh, at the higher dose, uh, but then that um, uh, reduction in seizure frequency is maintained uh, at the 45 milligram dose that is given every four months uh, thereafter. Moving beyond seizures, uh, what is uh, equally uh, exciting is uh, some of the improvements in non-seizure related symptoms or, or, or comorbidities, right? Dravet syndrome is a syndrome that is much more than just seizures. And while seizures are certainly the most concerning uh, and unmet need um, for many of these patients, uh, a very close uh, second are all of these um, uh, cognitive and other non-seizure related comorbidities with a specific uh, focus on communication, uh, gross motor skills, fine motor skills, uh, and, and many others. Uh, and so we have been very interested in following each of these developmental and cognitive domains uh, over time. And now that we actually have data uh, going out uh, for upwards of a, a year, uh, we have a lot more um, uh, data points to see, to show, actually, um, that we're seeing a departure uh, from what we would expect based on natural history. Uh, and the natural history study was done looking at patients over a two-year period and shows that uh, while these patients do make slow improvements, that they continue to fall farther and farther behind uh, their sort of age-matched neurotypical peers. And so in the open label extension studies, by using uh, the different subdomains on the Vineland 3, we're actually seeing clinically uh, meaningful improvements in various subdomains um, that do suggest this is uh, disease modifying, which we're all really, really uh, very excited about. So I've been spending a lot of time here uh, focusing on the efficacy, both with regard to seizure reduction and improvements in some of these non-seizure endpoints. And so um, I, I feel like I need to also talk about uh, the adverse event uh, profile. Thankfully, uh, the intervention, the treatment has been um, very well tolerated. The most uh, common uh, side effect that we have actually uh, seen is an elevated uh, CSF protein, um, which has not actually had any clinical symptoms uh, associated uh, with it. And we continue to follow um, these elevated CSF proteins uh, over time. Interestingly, it does not happen in everyone, and it also doesn't seem to be dose-related. So there are patients that um, were uh, where it was seen uh, at the lower dose, and there are patients that have been receiving the higher dose 
um, and they still have normal CSF proteins. So that's something um, that is continuing uh, to, to be followed. There have also been some adverse events related to the lumbar puncture itself, which are to be expected um, when, when patients are undergoing um, a, a lumbar puncture for, for any reason. Uh, and then there is one um, uh, serious, unsuspected serious adverse um, reaction um, in, in a single patient. Uh, and that patient is still being closely followed. So I think the diagnosis of Dravet syndrome has really um, improved dramatically uh, over the last three to four years, and that's largely been due to the more widespread availability of genetic testing. So um, either a clinician can be suspecting that diagnosis of Dravet syndrome and, be, and send off genetic testings to sort of be more confident and, and actually confirm uh, the diagnosis. Or equally important, um, I think many child neurologists are now um, sending an epilepsy gene panel in the early onset epilepsies. And even if they're not suspecting the diagnosis of Dravet syndrome, if they get a pathogenic variant in the SCN1A gene in a patient who's had a couple of prolonged seizures in the setting of fever, it is really allowing us to almost um, accidentally, for lack of a better word, uh, uh, make that diagnosis. Um, and so I think the early diagnosis is really helping us um, avoid contraindicated medications, which is really, really important because the, the use of contraindicated medications, namely the sodium channel blockers, uh, can have a negative impact on the overall long-term uh, developmental outcomes. Um, but more importantly, um, we are starting to use these syndrome-specific medications that actually uh, we have good safety and tolerability and efficacy uh, uh, data on. Uh, and I think this community, the fact that they're so um, well organized um, and these therapies, these disease modifying therapies and different you know, gene genetic approaches is really allowing uh, us to enroll these studies as quickly as possible so that perhaps we can actually uh, uh, offer these treatments to patients that may not meet the strict inclusion exclusion criteria and allow it to be uh, used uh, more, more widespread, ideally uh, as early as possible.